Um, hello, and welcome to episode nine of the National Task Force on Lawyer Wellbeing podcast series, The Path to Wellbeing in Law. I'm your co host, Chris Newbold, Executive Vice President of Alps Malpractice Insurance. And as you know, our goal here is, is simple uh, to introduce you to interesting leaders doing awesome work in the space of lawyer wellbeing. And in the process, build and nurture a national network of well-being advocates intent on creating a culture shift within the legal profession. Once again, I'm joined by my friend, Bree Buchanan. How are you today, Bree? I'm doing great. Hello, everyone. Awesome. And today, you know, we're going to continue our march around the states. And uh, you know, many of the states have really taken charge in, in, in the well-being movement, uh, engaging in initiatives, commitments, and, and, and success. And We've previously on the podcast talked to leaders in Virginia and Massachusetts and Utah. And today we turn our attention to the Green Mountain State, otherwise known as Vermont. And we're very excited to welcome our friend and fellow National Task Force on Lawyer Wellbeing member, Chief Justice Paul Ryber to the podcast. Bree, would you be so kind to introduce Chief Justice Ryber uh, to our audience? I would be delighted to do so. And um, it's a real honor that Chief, you can imagine, very distinguished individual, but as you will hear over the course of this uh, podcast, a really delightful human being. And that wasn't in the bio, so I just had to, <laughs> had to add that. So I'm gonna give you, <laughs> the, you. The, the official oh, nice. bio nice. um, that uh, Paul Ryber was appointed to the Vermont Supreme Court as an Associate Justice in October of 2003 and a le year later as the Chief Justice in 2004. In 2010, he served as chair of the Vermont Commission on Judicial Operations, resulting in historic legislation that unified the state court system. He now chairs the Vermont Justice Reinvestment to Working Group and co-chairs the Chief Justice Task Force for Children and the Vermont Commission on Well-Being of the Legal Profession. And we'll hear more about that in a few minutes. He most impressively, I think, I mean, there's many impressive things, but he is immediate past president of the Conference of Chief Justices. He is the 2018-2019 chairman of the board of the National Center for State Courts and involved in several other efforts devoted to access to justice and the rule of law, which includes his uh, sitting on the board effectively of the National Task Force. He is a fellow of the American Bar Foundation, the American Law Institute, and active in his local chapter of the American Ends of Court. Chief Ryber, welcome to our podcast. We're so delighted to have you here today. Thank you so much, Bree and Chris. Thank you. It's, it's a pleasure to join you here. And a question we ask, we've, we've got uh, started a tradition here of asking each of our guests at the very beginning about their... Um, what is behind their passion for the lawyer well-being movement? What, what brought you to this work? Because we, you and I have been working on this together for I'd say three years. And, and I know right. that you are very passionate about this. So if you could yeah. talk a little bit about what brings you to this work. Well, it's a, it's a good question. Uh, and I'm glad you asked it. I, you know, I was a, uh, I, I was not a, trial judge before I came on the court, before I came to the Supreme Court. Uh, so I was appointed directly out of private practice. And I was a trial lawyer in private practice. And I think as is uh, not uncommon uh, among uh, members of the bar who engage in the same kind of practice, uh, as I told the uh, the Vermont Bar Association, when I spoke to them the first time about this subject a few years ago, I said, uh, you know, all of us have got challenges in our lives, but in particular, uh, those of us who practice law and those of us who go to court, many of us suffer from anxiety and depression and substance abuse. And I said, and I have checked off all of those boxes. Um, so I, I had a very personal uh, real world interest in this uh, and was excited when the uh, report came out uh, several years ago, uh, was presented to the Conference of Chief Justices uh, at our annual meeting in Philadelphia and a resolution was passed there. And I came home 
uh, back to Vermont, and we immediately started to uh, uh, to address it. Yeah, and it's it, it, it's interesting that you know I, I think you came back, and I think that your first probably act was to was to begin a dialogue about developing a commission on the well-being of legal profession of the legal yeah. profession there in Vermont. That's talk, right. Talk, yeah, yeah, talk to us about how that kind of got started. What your role well, was. You Please know, that, right? I, uh, <laughs> I had all of us have got uh, close friends that we uh, collaborate with and brainstorm with on uh, different issues. And a good friend of mine who was on the trial bench at the time uh, and has now joined me on the Supreme Court uh, is Bill Cohen. And and mm -hmm. Bill and I had practiced together. Uh, he also was a trial lawyer. We, we were uh, in the same firm, had offices uh, down the hall from each other, uh, shared cases, uh, tried uh, cases together. Good friends have known each other for a long time. And I brought it to Bill. Uh, and I'll tell you who else, Terry Corsones, uh, who was then and is now the executive director of the Vermont Bar Association. And another great guy, both of you may know, uh, Mike Kennedy, who is uh, our bar counsel uh, here in Vermont and uh, really is a, is a terrific uh, contributor uh, to, in many, many ways, the well-being of the, of the profession. And the four of us sat down together that fall. And I wanna say it was uh, the fall of 2017, but I'm not exactly sure. It was, the fall, it was right after the report, uh, the national report issued Right, that was fall of 2017. Okay, so we and we met uh, two or three times. One of the things that I thought was very important, we all thought was important, was not only that we get a project started, but that we uh, make sure that we had the full uh, and unequivocal support of the entire Vermont Supreme Court, my colleagues on the court. And so uh, we uh, outlined a, a program uh, that we wanted to uh, that we wanted to pursue, essentially uh, by forming a commission that uh, simply mirrored exactly the the uh, outline that was provided in the national report. Uh, we did that. We presented. We put it in writing. Uh, presented it to my colleagues on the court. Uh, uh, they were enthusiastic in supporting it, and the court eventually issued, and I don't mean to suggest there was a, a delay, uh, but the court issued what we call a charge and designation, uh, which is uh, uh, an administrative uh, sort of uh, 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 document uh, that, that uh, reflected on the need for this uh, effort to be undertaken. Uh, reflected on the fact that the uh, national report had issued, uh, recited uh, the uh, uh, resolution that the joint uh, conferences of chief justices and court administrators had passed earlier uh, that year in uh, Philadelphia, as I said, uh, and then uh, concluded that, that an effort needed to be made here in Vermont um, to evaluate uh, th this uh, uh, concern that we all shared about uh, mental health, uh, substance abuse uh, among uh, members of the bar. And so we began that uh, process uh, with a commission that was formed uh, under the charge and designation the, the entire court signed off on. And Chief, that charge and designation, by the way, is on the National Task Force's website, lawyerwellbeing.net. Oh, good. Oh, good. Yeah, and I've, we've actually um, offered that up to other states at times who are trying to figure out how to get it started in their own state, how to the, their own Supreme Court to have the, the authority, I guess, to, to move yeah. forward. And so it's been a useful document and a sample for other courts. Well, I'm glad to hear that, Bree. I, I wasn't aware of that. You know, one of the things I thought was very important was that we put a timetable on the effort. And so we called for uh, the commission that we formed to report back to the court uh, within, uh, I think it was within 12 months, by the end of uh, 2018, uh, with uh, specific recommendations. Uh, and um, 
uh, in fact, and we'll, we, we can discuss this down the road as well, but we have renewed that charge and designation, by the way, um, as a result of the fact that the first uh, charge uh, expired on its own terms. There's a couple of things, Chief, that I just love about kind of what happened is, is I mean, first of all, Vermont, uh, uh, again, I'm guessing it's a lot like Montana where, you know, these smaller bars, it's just very easy to know lots of people, right? Yeah. And to bring yeah. the people to <laughs> yeah. the table. Yeah. Um, because you you really did jump out in, in front of the, the movement, so to speak, in terms of, I mean, the report yeah. was released, but that was a call to action that you answered, right? And and we needed states like yes. you to answer that call. It was such an important part of the growth of our, of the well-being movement because you, know, you guys just kind of took the baton and ran. Yeah, but you know, Chris, it, there's sobering, uh, not meaning to make a pun, uh, sobering uh, uh, things that are going on uh, that really are very important for us to pay attention to. Uh, you know, there's suicides. There are, there are lawyers who are suffering from depression, uh, anxiety, substance abuse, who, uh, who have, there was a front page, this is one of the things that motivated me, by the way, uh, in the front page article, uh, you both may remember in the business section of the Sunday New York Times about that time, about that the, mm -hmm. the, the summer of 2017. Absolutely, yeah. Profiled a young a father, a very, very successful lawyer in California who had two homes, as I remember it, uh, including a home in, I think, Nevada or, or one of the Western states, but lived in California. A uh, uh, very successful guy with a young family, two, two young kids and, and uh, committed suicide. This is really a problem. You know, I'll tell you something. You... Uh, say we got out in front of it, or it's not exactly you suggest that, uh, between the time that my court issued its charge and designation uh, and the day I gave a speech to the bar in March of 2018 about the importance of this problem, we lost two lawyers in this state, two yeah. lawyers in this small state. Mm -hmm. um, it, it, it's, it, this is uh, a problem that uh, we cannot allowed to languish. We have to bring attention to it. We have to bring our best efforts to trying to make sure that people understand that uh, this is uh, something that uh, uh, has to be addressed. And unfortunately, um, there are so many people, when I get up and speak and talk to people in the audience, about the issue of suicide. There are so many people, if you've been in the profession for very long at all, yeah. you know someone That's or right. know of someone. That's right. And um, and the, the only silver lining to that situation is that it has spurred a lot of uh, changes in the yeah. profession. Yeah. yeah. Well, that's it's, true. You know, I, I breathe the first time you and I met was when I telephoned you on your honeymoon, if you don't mind me bringing this up, uh, I hope you did. You called me in New Zealand. In New Zealand. <laughs> <laughs> I got your number and uh, you said, who is this guy trying to get a hold of me? And I was on a panel, um, I think with, with um, Shahid maybe down in Miami at the University of Miami Law School. Judge David Shahid. Yeah, yeah great guy, great, great guy. And, and uh, um, uh, Jaffe was there as well. Um, David Jaffe. David right. Jaffe, our friend mm -hmm. from uh, American University Law School, right? And, and we were there talking about uh, this problem uh, to a group, a very broad cross section of people, by the way. Um, and I remember telling them that we have, our profession has changed. It has changed. It already has changed. And it, uh, of course, it needs, needs, we need to continue on this uh, trend. But when I started practicing law back in the 70s, uh, and I mentioned this, uh, lawyers I know, uh, including myself, by the way, uh, would, would mark a trip to a court in, a, in another city, 60 miles away, let's say Burlington, Vermont, by the number of beers 
that the that you would consume on the trip. <laughs> oh All right. So we would say, oh, I've got to go to court. Now, I'm not suggesting that we'd necessarily drink before the hearing, although many lawyers did, believe me. Uh, but it was uh, the trip home. Uh, that's oh, going to I've got to go to court in Burlington uh, this week. That's a two beer trip, somebody would say. This is this was very commonplace in my state. Uh, and alcohol, you know, the, there was a, a bar in uh, my home uh, of Rutland, Vermont, uh, called the Carriage Room. And uh, I'll bet there's a story similar in many, many other locations around the country. Lawyers would try a case down the street and go to the carriage room and wait for the jury's verdict. And the clerk of the court knew where to find you. You know, you call the carriage room if you want to find Paul Reiber, because that's where he's uh, uh, he's hanging out drinking with his buddies. That's the way it worked. So let me say, I you know, I gave up uh, drinking uh, many years ago uh, because of the of the of the uh, finally recognizing the problem uh, that it was it, it was it was beginning to dominate my life. We had two uh, kids uh, in high school. Uh, I was drinking wine with dinner every night. My wife doesn't drink. She never has. It was not right. And I, I felt like I was letting my family down and I gave it up. And I, I had, um, uh, you know, the, uh, I'm, I'm pleased to say that, but this was very, very common among the trial bar in my state. And I suspect that's not a unique story. Chief, let's talk a little bit about the, the, the state action plan, right? So, yeah, so yeah. You, you, you brought the constituencies, the stakeholders together. Yeah. Uh, you guys got to work, right? I, I love the notion and I love the, I think the recommendation that you're making to others who embark on this to, to set it up in a time frame basis, right? Because right. I think that that right. kind, of, kind, of, kind of let the clock start ticking right. uh, in terms of what we needed to do. But right. you, know, you really came out and, and again, we're, we're going to publish uh, this in conjunction with the podcast and on the National Task Force. Uh, site, but but your state action plan you know, is, is really a, a phenomenal roadmap for recommendations and opportunities to advance well-being. Yeah. I'd love for you to talk a little bit about what you're most proud of that's kind of come out of that process on the on the state action plan uh, front. Well, I, I'll tell you what I, to be honest, what I'm most proud of are the number of lawyers that have stepped forward to uh, contribute uh, to this effort. Uh, you know, we had, as you know, Chris, uh, uh, several different committees that we formed again, following the the uh, uh, the outline of the of the national report. So we had a uh, a law school committee that was chaired by the dean of. We, we have one law school in Vermont, great guy named Tom McHenry, uh, is the dean, and he chaired that committee. Uh, we had a lawyers committee that actually was co-chaired by. Uh, an attorney from Burlington who uh, ostensibly represented the large firm uh, sector of the state, and then a, a, a woman from uh, the Northeast Kingdom part of Vermont who uh, represented, if you will, the small firm uh, segment of the state. Uh, we had a regulators committee. We had a judges committee that my friend Bill Cohen uh, chaired. Uh, this is this, and, and I, you know, it, these are people who. Uh, and they each had, by the way, uh, several uh, volunteer lawyers and with the dean's uh, situation, uh, students and, and faculty uh, who stepped forward to participate uh, in the effort. And that, the thing I'm most proud of is the fact that all of these people uh, put themselves out, uh, spoke. Uh, publicly about the importance of this and brought uh, their perspective on uh, moving the ball forward with regard to addressing uh, the real needs that uh, I think uh, the attorneys have and, and the judges, by the way. You know, I don't mean to, dis to leave judges out. I think the bench is a very important part of this um, and, and the student body, uh, the student uh, students as well, law students as well. Absolutely. Yeah. And uh, what I've seen just across in states is where the, the people who come to the table to work on this project 
find it so fulfilling. Yeah. You know, lawyers care about the legal profession and one another. And so to be able to take affirmative action and step forward and do something about a problem that we all see, maybe not on ourselves, but over the course of our career and actually take some positive action. I'm wondering yeah. out of that, the state action plan, which for that, that's the, the name on the document that came out from your work, um, some of the states have like a, a report and yours actually has a state action plan. Can you talk about some of the, the pieces in that action plan, the recommendations that you made yeah, no. that stick out? Yeah, absolutely. Um, the, um, uh, the recommendations included, uh, and these are things that we've actually done as well, uh, through the court's uh, 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 interventions. We amended uh, the comments to Rule 1.1 of the Vermont Rules of Professional Conduct to acknowledge that maintaining a lawyer's well-being is an, an important aspect of maintaining competence uh, in the practice of law. We amended the mandatory uh, uh, continuing legal education uh, rules to require at least one credit hour per reporting period of attorney wellness program programming. Uh, we promulgated rule changes uh, to create uh, a bar assistance program within Vermont's professional responsibility program. Those are uh, changes that actually We've just adopted and will take effect in, I think it's February, February 1. And uh, I think importantly as well, we extended, as I alluded to earlier, the uh, commission uh, and uh, commission's charge and designation and called upon the commission to annually review the progress of the state action plan and to report back to the Supreme Court uh, on its progress, something that a, the first annual report under the, under the renewed charge and designation issued uh, just earlier this year in June. Uh, so the, you know, the focus is to attempt to bring uh, life to the work and to, in a way that acknowledges, uh, you know, that there is no off on switch to fixing this. It's not a matter that uh, you simply, I mean, what, what we're talking about is our problems of the human condition, right? These are behavioral problems, uh, problems that uh, need to be addressed through a thoughtful, respectful, uh, empathetic uh, means that help people uh, along and bring them to a better understanding of uh, of, of, uh, of their situation and, 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 and feeling better about uh, where they are and, and in particular about the practice of law. I think the thing that's really exciting about what you have, what, what you have done there in Vermont is, I mean, you obviously you took, took the national report, right? And use that as a template to build yep. state-based engaged lawyers around committees. I mean, again, for, the, for our, our, our audience, you know, this is this is about a hundred page report right and it's chock full of in, in each of the committee areas the judges committee the bar association the regulators the law school the legal employers you know i know you've made some progress on the lawyers assistance program front yep. as well yeah um, yep. you know again i played a small role on the from the professional liability <laughs> carrier you sure uh, did right? you so, did and thank you for that yeah so it 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 it, it, it is really interesting because i think each one of those committees have you know, both identified and begun to enact recommendations. I mean, there's five to ten recommendations in each area. So if you're if you're looking for ideas uh, about what Vermont's done, and again, Vermont's a, a a smaller state, obviously less than less than uh, I think five thousand lawyers, right? And so that's uh, right. This is, yeah, this is a really interesting template for a lot of other kind of rural states out there that I think face similar issues in terms of. Yeah. either geographic distance or just uh, demographics of the, of the profession. Yeah. And I think our role is a little bit different when you get to the smaller bar size. Yeah, the, and the bar size does make a difference. The office size, you know, we have a lot of sole practitioners in the state, small firm 
uh, profiles in the state. Uh, uh, and, and this is a problem uh, that uh, crosses all boundaries, uh, large firm, small firm. Uh, and people have taken, uh, 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 the evidence is that people are taking this seriously and really, um, uh, I think, uh, uh, putting effort into addressing uh, the needs that we've got. Excellent. Well, this is this is a really, I think a good time for us to take a break and listen, uh, hear from one of our one of our sponsors. Uh, you know, this is an awesome conversation. I just love what's going on in Vermont, and and uh, so we'll be back right after the break. Welcome back, everybody. This is Bree Buchanan, and we have with our our guest today, Chief Justice Paul Ryber of the Vermont Supreme Court, and we're having a wonderful, very candid um, conversation here today. And so, Chief, we've, we've heard about the process of developing the, the state action plan for Vermont, and it's been about two years, I believe, since that was published, coming up on, I think the date on it is December 31st, 2018. Right. What has been the trajectory of the well-being movement in Vermont since its publication? Well, you know, we have, uh, uh, one of the things uh, I'd like to do is sing the praises of the Vermont Bar Association, uh, Terry Corsones and the leadership, the board, uh, the president. Uh, these folks uh, have been extremely uh, instrumental in, in keeping uh, the news uh, of the need to address, for lawyers to address this alive. Uh, we are uh, seeing uh, it's a little bit difficult to put your finger on given the virus and the fact that face-to-face -face, uh, meetings have uh, suspended for the last several months. But they, uh, the Bar Association at their regular meetings, and we have an independent Bar Association, by the way, it is not connected to the court, it's not within the court, uh, but they have a, um, a well, they have specifically identified wellness uh, uh, seminars for every one of their meetings uh, that they're offering, which is terrific. In addition to that, uh, Mike Kennedy, uh, terrific Mike Kennedy and uh, Terry Corsones and the VBA are publishing regularly in the Bar Association Journal um, a, a, a story about a lawyer in Vermont who, uh, 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 I forget the title of it, but it's basically about how to maintain balance in your life. Um, how to, uh, you know, they, they profile an attorney who has a, a great uh, road running program that they follow uh, and, uh, and, and profile that. Uh, somebody else who is uh, very uh, involved in, uh, uh, in, in art uh, in a way that uh, is, uh, some, is, a, is a project that helps them maintain balance in their life. So this is, this is, I think, very, very important to keeping this uh, issue fresh in people's minds. And in addition to this, uh, Mike tells me that uh, some of the larger firms actually are bringing him in to speak to their lawyers during the noon hour. Again, this is before the, the, uh, the pandemic, um, uh, to uh, provide them with... Uh, uh, you know, so, uh, with ideas and, and incentive uh, for uh, maintaining balance in their lives. So I'm very, very pleased about uh, the work of, uh, of, of the bar in this respect. And um, I, uh, uh, I give credit to uh, the folks that are really uh, uh, carrying the heavy load on them. Sounds like there's been a real commitment on behalf of again all the players involved to just yeah. keep this issue front and center right yeah. because it's you know again if we don't tackle it you know nobody's going to tackle it right because it's it's the life that's the profession that we're currently in and and uh and there's certainly room for for improvement there well you know i years ago i met with a great uh trial lawyer out in salt lake city about a about reforming uh, the, the civil rules in my state, uh, something that they had done in Utah uh, and were very successful with. And I, I have this, I had this uh, lawyer's name who spearheaded the project. And I had lunch with him and I said to him, tell me, Francis, tell me, 
how can I do this back home in Vermont? He said, what you need is a guy like me. <laughs> because he was the one who um, uh, really uh, pushed it through. He was a trial lawyer and he, uh, you know, he headed the thing up. Well, I would tell you that I've got people like Terry Corsones and Michael Kennedy, who writes uh, a blog uh, the two of you may be aware of, uh, which is really excellent and frequently uh, addresses wellness issues. Mike is just a champion in this regard. So uh, I, we have a real heroes in this respect. And I think this is one of the keys to making this work is to find people who uh, are willing and have a genuine interest in committing to uh, addressing this problem. Well, let's not uh, let's not negate your role, right? From the from the head of the judiciary. I mean, again, I, I think it's uh, I, I think I'm making an observation that I think is true, which is when we have seen judiciary engagement on well-being, the the wheels of progress and the wheels of success uh, and 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 creativity and in initiatives has really flourished, right? So I, I'd love for you to just talk about you know, again, your your role from the, the Chief Justice perspective. And then I know how much this issue has also kind of caught hold as, a, as something that's being discussed amongst the Conference of Chief Justices. It is, which, yeah. Which is, which is really, I think, impressive in terms yeah. of your, I mean, as leaders of our profession, you're, you're contemplating and appreciating how, just how important this is to the health and yeah. well-being of our profession and our ability to serve society. Yeah, I, I think it, it, it actually is remarkable how this, uh, uh, how the interest, this has sparked an interest for uh, reform, if you want, in this area, in terms of some of the rule changes that I've mentioned that we've made here, and simply embracing uh, the need to uh, uh, bring the problem to the forefront and talk about it and get people's attention on it. It has across the country. You know, I see uh, colleagues, uh, chiefs in other states, one after another, who have formed these uh, commissions. Um, you know, I'd like to remember, as a matter of fact, in that regard, my friend Ralph Gantz, who passed away suddenly about a month ago, mm -hmm. uh, was the chief justice of the SJC in Massachusetts. Right. Uh, Ralph had started... Um, before he died, and I attended his uh, memorial uh, virtually, actually, but a course uh, that was put on by Northeastern University Law School, a really wonderful uh, tribute to him. And, and, but he had started a project just like this. We had talked about it, as a matter of fact, he and I were on a panel at a New England uh, Bar Association meeting a few years ago, along with Paul Sattel from Rhode Island, and, and we all talked to the members of the New England Bar about this and the interest that we all shared in promoting this in our respective states. And uh, Ralph had uh, done great work in this regard in bringing it forward with the Massachusetts Bar. Um, but I see it every, you know, Hawaii. Uh, Mark Rechtenwald is the chief out there. Mark has started a project. Uh, he and I talked about that. It, it is... Um, it is really uh, taking hold across the country. And I think it is a recognition of the need for a sea change uh, from those days I, I mentioned back in the 70s when I started practicing law and the, the trips, you know, the court. Uh, and I, I think everybody is recognizing that this is a moment that we need to change our, our uh, perspective. And uh, I'm really pleased to see it. It's really encouraging and it makes you feel like it's kind of the right idea at the right time, the way it has taken off. And Isn't that true? Yeah. Yeah. And on the homepage of our website, lawyerwellbeing.net, if you scroll down, there's an interactive map where you can see all the states that are taking this on. And it's just such a delight every time we can go in and, yeah. and highlight another state where uh, a Supreme Court or a state bar has taken this on and done a multi-stakeholder initiative and I think there's 32 or 33 states so it's um, yeah it's absolutely 
Yeah. Chief, before we go, I wanted to just, I don't want to pass up all the opportunity to ask you about just any lessons learned in this process, any lessons learned that you can pass on to other states, maybe other uh, Supreme Court justices or just people, you know, state bar leaders that are thinking they want to start their own well-being task force or something similar. What would you share with them? Um, I, you know, Bree, uh, I think picking up on what I said a few moments ago, I think a key to getting it started is identifying two or three people uh, in your jurisdiction uh, who are um, uh, thoughtful in this direction and interested in this direction and begin to put together the seeds of a, of a project like ours. Uh, and then begin and then, and then build it and build it in a way that it has the uh, force and the authority of the Supreme Court. Something uh, I would uh, Im imagine is uh, uh, available in, in every jurisdiction uh, once they uh, have uh, attention brought to the, to the issue. Um, I think the people and identifying the right people uh, is extremely important. But the other thing I would say is don't wait. Uh, you can't wait. There, 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 there's, uh, there are people who are, um, uh, you know, dealing with these problems. They need help. We, we need to be uh, in the forefront of helping. Them. We are in a profession uh, that has um, susceptibility, uh, great susceptibility to these issues and and as leaders we need to tackle those issues uh, so uh, don't wait identify the uh, key people who can help uh, get the project off the ground and then engage uh, your court to uh, support uh, uh, the effort at the outset one, one final question that I would that I would ask you is is you know as we think about, where this movement goes, you know, I, I live in the business world, and we're always talking about what our what our you know key success indicators are, right? And as no. you think about the well-being movement and the health and the vibrancy of our profession, I'm just kind of curious your perspective on how do we measure success in terms of getting <laughs> to a point that we feel better than obviously we are today, and in, in, in knowing that there's a there's a long road ahead of us. But how, how do we measure success? Oh, you, you, you saved the toughest question for the last, Chris. That's not fair. I don't think you can. You should, <laughs> how do we measure success? Huh? That's a, a tough question. Off script, I would, I'd that's a, that's, no, 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 no. That's all right. I don't mean that. I don't mean that. That's a, that's a, tough, that's a tough chore. Um, yeah. I think part of what uh, we do is we make sure that we're accountable uh, for the um, – of, for the work that we do, that we start, I, I I don't like the idea of just starting a project like this and letting it um, mature on its own uh, uh, on its own schedule on its own timetable, and then not having uh, some accountability uh, back to uh, an authority like the Supreme Court. Doesn't have to be, I suppose, but I think that the court and the justices can play a very uh, important role in that regard. So accountability and putting people on a time, I think are very, very important in terms of trying to find success, but measuring success, boy, I, that's a, I mean, I don't know what the answer to that is. Uh, I have a feeling that there is uh, success uh, in this regard, just because of the work that two of you have done and obviously the success that you're having in bringing this word uh, out uh, uh, to the profession. Uh, but uh, data, uh, I don't know. I don't know how you would do that. I think the problem, as I mentioned, is part of the human condition. And it is something that uh, we all struggle with in a uh, fashion in our own personal lives. And it's not something, like I said before, that you just uh, can turn the switch on and off uh, with. So I think it's a very important problem uh, that we have in front of us, and we have to keep talking about it. Yeah, for sure. Absolutely. 
Well, thank you so much, Chief Justice Paul Ryber of the Vermont Supreme Court. What a, you know, I know that you have, you've been a leader in our, in our movement. And I, I know that uh, you, you would just say, I brought an idea home and I got things rolling, but, uh, <laughs> but the, these are, these are, these are the big, these are the small steps that lead to the big steps that lead to yeah. the ripple effect yeah. that ultimately, you know, allowed Vermont to go out front uh, and, and, uh, and start to pave the way for a pathway toward uh, a recognition that, you know, to be a good lawyer, you have to be a healthy lawyer, right? And, exactly. and that, uh, exactly. that ultimately, you know, our, our ability as a profession to be able to uh, deliver to society is premised on, on us, you know, perhaps thinking about the way that we uh, attack the profession in just a little bit of a different way. Yeah. Well, so, thank you. Thank you both for what you're doing. Thank Very you. Much appreciate it. Absolutely. All right. So we will be back in a couple of weeks uh, with uh, another well-being guest. Uh, and, and until then, stay well out there. I know it's, you know, we're in the, we're in the midst of, of, of the pandemic. And I know uh, we are at a point now around the country where, where, uh, where numbers are as high as they've ever been, which again, I think uh, creates more challenges when it comes to uh, both the administration of justice uh, but also the well, the health and the well-being of of lawyers, and um, you know, probably probably time for us to bring on a couple of guests to actually talk specifically about you know how COVID has impacted the well-being uh, of lawyers. So uh, stay tuned for that on the horizon. And until then, be well. Thanks for joining us. Thank you.